Well, good morning. My name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and it is wonderful to be here this morning. Do you notice a certain theme that keeps coming up? You heard it in Steve's prayer. It was in, I think, every single song we sang, and it's in the reading that the Hardings just did for us. It's the theme that Jesus is king. He is king today, and someday we will experience his rule without the taint of sin, without fear, without insecurity, and we are looking forward to that day. Well, I love Christmas. I love Christmas movies. You guys like Christmas movies? Uh, I'm not sure it qualifies as a Christmas movie, but uh, I love the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Um, we love watching White Christmas. Of course, there's the classic Christmas movie, Die Hard. <laughs> I think one of our family's favorite, if not our family's favorite, is It's a Wonderful Life. Bless you. Um, that's not part of the title. Now, you might remember, or if you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on. Jimmy Stewart plays a guy named George Bailey, who is a very nice self-sacrificial, hardworking man. But unfortunately, he has something in life that just drastically, traumatically, devastatingly goes against him. And at one point, things seem so bad to George Bailey that he wishes that he had never been born. Enter Clarence the Angel. Clarence the Angel grants George his wish. And of course, what George sees as he experiences the world as if he had never been born is that the world is a horrible place without George Bailey. Because George had never been born, his brother died young, and then later in life, people who his brother would have saved died. There's a beloved old man in the George Bailey world who is despised and abused in the world of Clarence the Angel. The town where they live is a wonderful, moral, upright community. But in Clarence's world, it's filled with, uh, shall we say, questionable establishments. The world Clarence the Angel shows George is full of corruption and confusion. And the culminating point of, of life in Clarence's world comes when George sees the woman who in his own world is his wife. And he sees her and she has never married. And worst of all, she is a librarian. <laughs> Apparently, the implication is that the worst possible fate you could have is being a librarian. Heaven forbid that a loved one becomes a librarian. Let them be mobsters, just not librarians. And this is too much for George. So he decides that actually the world is better with him, and he wants things to go back to the way they were supposed to be. And of course, that was Clarence's plan all along, and Clarence takes him back to the way things are supposed to be. And it's interesting that at that point, we intersect one of the major themes of Scripture. One of the main themes of the Bible is that the world that we live in is a lot like the world that Clarence the Angel showed George Bailey. Things are not the way they are supposed to be. Just like George Bailey, we look around at the world and we are constantly saying to ourselves, this isn't right. And we often don't know why. We often just know that something is wrong. Maybe we can't put our finger quite on it, but, but something is welling up inside of us that is a desire to go home. We want a world where things make sense. We want a world where people treat each other well. We don't want to live in fear of disease and destruction. We don't want to live in a world where we feel alone. We live waiting to go home. Advent, which is the first four weeks leading up to Christmas, 
is all about waiting. It's a celebration, have you heard, of the anticipation of Jesus coming on the first Christmas. And it's a celebration of our waiting for his return. And that's the theme of our Advent this year. We are looking at waiting. We've called the series, The Meaning is in the Waiting, because we want to highlight the fact that in our culture, we tend to think of waiting as a waste of time. We tend to think of waiting as what you do until you get what's important. And we want to remind ourselves that God constantly puts his people in positions of waiting because he is active and doing something even while we wait. And so our series is taking us through key people and passages who lived in waiting. Last week we looked at Abraham. He was waiting for God to fulfill his promise to form Abraham's descendants into a great nation and give them a home, give them a land. And then God would bless the entire world through that nation. This week we look at the prophets and specifically Isaiah. And by the time we get to the prophets, the hope that began with Abraham is starting to come into focus. Abraham's descendants have become a nation. They are in and out of the promised land. And now as we see in the prophets, we're getting clarity on how this nation in this land is going to bless the entire world. Isaiah describes a king who will come and he will set right what is broken in the world. And the first thing that is set right will be broken relationships. And that's really the highlight of verses one through five. Okay, I'm not getting political. Depending on how you view any particular president, there is either good news or bad news about our political system. At some point, that president's leadership ends. There are limits to how much good or how much damage a president can do. Right now, that wasn't the case in Isaiah's day. In Isaiah's day, a king ruled for a lifetime. And if that was a long lifetime, then that king had the ability to, for decades, set the tone for the society and for how people related to one another. And so in Isaiah's time, they were a society that was experiencing anxiety because of things happening internationally. They were a society that was seeing growing gaps between the poor and the wealthy, between the powerful and the powerless. And the poor and the powerless were regularly being mistreated, and they had no idea how long they would stay in that condition. And Isaiah, in these first five verses, gives us a picture of a very different type of society because they are under a very different type of king. A king is coming who will set the tone for society better than anything that can they, they can imagine. It talks in this verse about a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Who was Jesse? Jesse was King David's father. So the idea here is this king that is coming is going to be the same type of king as David. And King David was the king during Israel's greatest and most glorious time. But isn't it interesting that it says it's from the stump of Jesse? The idea is that there's been a series of kings that have come after David, and a lot of those kings have been bad. A lot of those kings have been corrupt. A lot of those kings have taken people away from worshiping the true God. And Isaiah promises this king that's coming, it's like we're going to ignore all that series of bad kings, and we are going back to the root. This king will be like from the root of where David came from. But as the prophecy goes on, things are even better than under David's rule. This king has a special relationship with God. That's what verse 2 is all about. In fact, you could say that the Holy Spirit, in some ways, is kind of the hero of this passage because he's the one that makes everything possible. The Holy Spirit will give this king unique ability to rule, to make plans, to carry those plans out successfully. And all of this will happen because this king has a deep knowledge of who God is and a deep regard for the Lord. This king will delight in living with and living for the Lord. 
the rest of the section really describes what life will be like under the rule. There will be justice for everyone, according to verse 3, regardless of appearance, regardless of what people say about someone. It won't matter if someone is rich or poor or influential or insignificant. Verse 4 basically is just describing being held accountable. It's God, it's this king holding the wicked accountable so that evil and wickedness are removed. Verse 5 is amazingly fascinating. It talks about a child leading, I'm sorry, it talks about belts. Got ahead of myself. These belts are not like the belts that we think of. The word that's being used here refers to straps that would go under people's clothes. We're talking underwear. What in the world is he saying that righteousness and faithfulness will be this king's underwear? Here's the point. The point is you strip off everything else. You strip off every layer. You strip off everything that you see. And underneath this king is righteous and faithful. Every day, day after day, year after year, this king walks with God and does what is right. Because a society would take on the character of their king, By describing the king, Isaiah is describing a society of God's people treating one another fairly, of never taking advantage of one another, and all unrighteousness being removed. And this king, as we have said, is Jesus. These verses describe what life looks like under the rule of Jesus. And we long for it just like the prophets long for it. When we are taking advantage of, there is something inside of us that rises up and says, this is wrong. That is our longing for the rule of Jesus to bring peace and justice into this world. When we see people in poverty, it breaks our heart. That is the longing for the rule of Jesus to bring compassion and meet the needs of this world. When we see people hurt one another, and then leave a relationship instead of seeking forgiveness and healing. There's something inside of us that's unsettled. That is our longing for the rule of Jesus to keep us from sabotaging our relationships. People are not supposed to be treated badly. People are not supposed to be in misery. That's not life under Jesus' rule. Advent reminds us that our relationships will not always be as fragile as they are today. The mistreatment in this world will end. Advent encourages us to look forward to that day. But it also reminds us to live differently in anticipation of that day coming. We are to live like citizens of Jesus' kingdom. We are under his rule. We live with one another in a way that reflects Jesus' Rule, reign, kingship over our lives. This group in this room and every group like it that's a symbol around the world is meant to be an imperfect but living picture of what it looks like to live under the promised king. We are supposed to be pictures of what it looks like to relate to one another without favoritism, to care for one another in need, to make wise spirit-directed decisions, and to place wickedness. With righteousness. I'm really appreciative of families like the Akins or Dan and Katie Harrison, who I know are constantly trying to invite the neighbors and people around them into their lives. They might do something like host a game night for their neighbors. They might invite people to their home to eat. They might invite them to birthday parties. You see, here's what's going on that's so powerful when they do this. It is incredibly powerful when we invite our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends into our relationships with one another. 
You see, when we invite people who don't know the Lord to something like a small group Christmas party or a game night or dinner with friends from NBC, uh, FBC, the point is that we give them a glimpse of what relationships look like when lived under the reign of Jesus. We allow them to see people being treated kindly, people who don't gossip, people who encourage one another, people who don't ignore wounds but heal them. At least I hope that's what they see. Advent points us to the relationships with one another that we will have one day. But we're not the only ones affected. Salvation isn't just about us. Verses 6 through 9 show the king setting right a broken creation. Verses 6 through 9 give a picture of a utopia for all of creation. Predators and prey live in peace. Dogs and squirrels. Our dogs can't catch anything, so squirrels live in peace anyway. I love this last line. It's an amazing picture. It's what I was alluding to earlier. I got ahead of myself. In Isaiah's time, every village would have a young child that was designated. What that child would do is every morning he would get up early and he would lead the flocks out into the field so the flocks would graze. You see what this picture is? This picture is of wolves and leopards and lions and sheep and cows all obediently and peacefully following this little child as he leads them into the fields. You have the same theme in verse 7. Creation is that complete peace. But notice why. All the needs are met, and they are met in ways that don't pose a threat to anyone else. We as humans are part of creation. So what's the human version of what this looks like? Well, there are a lot of them. One of them that occurred to me is I don't need to build myself up by tearing other people down. Why? Because in this world, I will be completely confident that all my needs, especially my need to be valued, is completely and perfectly met. Verse 8 shows creation at peace because there's no need for protection. Children can have playtime with poisonous snakes. The things of nature that threaten us now, like snakes and disease and disaster, are not threats under Jesus' rule. This is a picture of creation, of life, without fear, without insecurity. What's the human version of that? It occurred to me that there are so many times that I might manipulate or change what I say or think to keep people from, from leaving me. I don't have to live in that type of security. It's worth pointing out as an aside that this is probably Anne's least favorite verse in the Bible. Um, because it suggests there might be snakes in heaven. Um, I got this picture in my mind of Anne and a snake having a conversation in heaven. Um, and Anne saying something like, I didn't like you very much. And the snake saying, I know because you chopped my head off with a shovel when I was sunbathing. Um, <laughs> but here's the point. This is a picture of life with every need met with no fear, with no insecurity. And according to verse 9, all of this is happening because creation is in God's presence and knows God deeply. My wife, Anne, can be a little bit frightening. She loves Jane Austen books. She loves Jane Austen movies. For some reason, she's not a fan of my favorite Jane Austen movie, Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies. <laughs> Anne's favorite movie is Emma. It's her comfort movie when she can't fall asleep. I've shared this story before, but it's worth repeating because it just reminds you of her powers. Um, I came to bed one night, and Emma was on TV. And Anne was curled up, facing the other direction, 
eyes closed. So I got into bed and I thought to myself, I should turn off the TV. And just as that thought formed in my mind, Anne said out loud, don't. <laughs> I'm listening to it. Now, there are two things that are frightening about that. First off is the fact that she knows this movie so well that she can watch it without watching it. But the scariest part is how in the world did she know what I was thinking? And every wife in here knows the answer to that question. She knew me. She knew me. She knows my thinking. She knows my tendencies. She knows what I'm likely to do when I'm put in a certain situation, like Emma is playing on TV and it looks to me like Anne's asleep. See, when we talk about knowing the Lord, when this passage talks about knowing the Lord, it's not just knowing facts about the Lord. It's not just knowing information about him. It's knowing him by experience. And this is the type of knowledge that is saying, that is, is desired and is had. We wait for the day when all of creation will know God like that, not just about him, not just data about him, but we'll know him through experience. We will know who God is, what he is like, how he thinks, how he relates, and it will be so ingrained in every creature in creation that they will always automatically react the way God wants them to react to every situation. We at this church talk about experiencing Jesus transforming lives. This is exactly what we are talking about. We are talking about knowing Jesus experientially so well that we are changed by him. A disciple of Jesus is someone who more and more automatically reacts to life in a way that is just like Jesus. And the reason he does this is because he knows Jesus so well. When I was in fifth grade, I started to learn how to play the trumpet. When I first started to learn how to play the trumpet, I would look at a note and I would have to think about which valves do I push? How do I position my lips, called an embouchure? I'd have to think about those things. By the time I graduated from high school, those were not things I thought about anymore. I could look at a piece of music and I just knew it. It wasn't conscious. It was my reaction. It was my response to the music that was in front of me. Why? Because I knew my instrument better. And the better that I knew my instrument, the more complicated the pieces of music that I could play. That's a great picture of what it is to know the Lord, to know Jesus and react to life, not by having to think about in every situation, what's right, what am I supposed to do, what does it mean to be like Jesus in this situation, but to walk into a situation, and the more we know Jesus, the more we know what he would do and how he would respond. And that's the fund fundamental principle at work here. The more that you truly, experientially know who Jesus is, the more that you become like him, the more you experience Jesus at work in your daily life, the more you automatically respond to life the way that he would respond. And there are a lot of ways of getting to know Jesus better every day. Reading our Bible is certainly important, going to church, but we need to pay attention to the daily work that he does in our lives. Do you read a passage that convicts you and then later that week, you have the perfect opportunity to apply it. Do you ever watch a TV ad and you find yourself thinking the values that are underneath that ad don't line up with the values of Jesus? Do you ever find yourself walking into a situation and saying, I have no idea what to do. But then you get a word of wisdom or a word of guidance from someone around you. That's profoundly helpful. What's going on in things like that? Well, here's the thing. God is not passive in our lives. He is every day working in our lives to help us to get to know him better. He is broadening and deepening our knowledge of him. And that 
is the only way that we will automatically respond to life like Jesus. And so we need to pay attention. Take stock every day. What have I learned about Jesus today? What has he shown me about who he is? How he's leading me? How have I experienced his grace and forgiveness? How has he challenged my thinking and my values? Pay attention to how, is it, how he is working in our lives to transform us. We wait for life completely under Jesus' rule. Then our relationships and all of creation will reflect God's character because we will know him. And we are not the only ones longing for this. The point of verse 10 is that those who don't know the Lord long for it. And as they long for it, they seek Jesus. And Jesus sets right broken people. When people see Jesus, they start to see his goodness, his compassion, his grace, his forgiveness. They see how he thinks. They see how he treats people, and they are drawn to him. And that's what's going on in verse 10. You see, any time in the Old Testament you see reference to the nations or the peoples, that's just another way of saying those who don't know God. Those who are not a part of the people of God. And so this is a picture of Jesus in a magnificent dwelling surrounded by a world transformed by his rule and people who have never been his followers are drawn to him. This word translated inquire is the idea that people are working and they are seeking out and they are continuing to pursue knowing who Jesus is and knowing what this king is all about. How is it possible to live a life in a world like this? How is it possible to live like God's people? This passage gives us a very different picture of what salvation is from how most people think of it. We have a tendency to think of salvation as meaning we go to heaven and avoid hell when we die. But do you see in these 10 verses that salvation is pictured as something much, much bigger? It certainly includes that. You see, salvation isn't just about you and me. All of creation is impact. It's not just something that happens after we die. We enter into living under the rule of Jesus even now. We begin to know the Lord more and more fully even now, and we are changed. We are changed in how we think. We are changed in what we value. We are changed in how we relate. And verse 10 says that people are drawn to Jesus when they see that in our lives. I think this passage also challenges us in how we think about what does it mean to share our faith? What does it mean to witness? For so many people, what they think that means is taking a tract and going door to door with a pre-planned message. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. The Holy Spirit can use anything. But that is not what is going on in this passage. And I would argue, actually, that's not what you see pretty much anywhere in the Bible. What you see in the Bible is what you see in this passage. Keep using those tools. There's nothing wrong with them. But I think a lot of times we use those tools, frankly, because they are easier and more comfortable than what this passage pictures. We are called to live in a way that pictures the world that is coming. We are called to live under Jesus' rule in a way that people around us see it. And that means that our neighbors, our co-workers should know us so well that they can give examples of how we are people of compassion, people of the truth, people of grace, people who are fair-minded, and all of these things in ways that they can never, ever explain. And that also means that we are around people and we are intersecting in and being involved in the lives of people that are different from us. People who use language that we don't use, who tell jokes that we don't tell, and who make decisions that we would never make. I wonder if sometimes we are so worried about what people will think if we are around those kinds of people. 
that we stop worrying about what God thinks when we're not. I had a um, really interesting conversation with someone this past week. Someone whose family is living out this passage beautifully. His family has spent significant time with an older single neighbor. This neighbor is not a Christian. And that has meant evenings at each other's homes. They have shared meals together. They have spent time in each other's backyards just talking about life. And guess what? It has become messy. It's become messy for a lot of different reasons. But I think one of the most important reasons if this neighbor is seeing something in this family that he can't explain, but he desperately wants it. And he is trying to get it in messy ways and sometimes very inappropriate ways. And this family is going to need to navigate that carefully. But something this man is seeing has stirred in him because of what he has seen in this family. Well, what has he seen? He's seen life under the reign of Jesus. He's seen people who are flawed but ask for forgiveness. He's seen people who are open with time and resources because they know their needs are being met. I have no idea if this person will come to know Jesus. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. We can't control it. But I know that he is getting a glimpse of a life under the rule of Jesus from this family. And through this family, Jesus is a signal to this man who desperately needs him. I wonder if Christians, if we need to spend some time repenting. If we need to spend some time repenting that we do not live as if Jesus meets our needs and protects us. I wonder if we need to spend some time repenting that our relationships with one another are really not that different from the relationships that people without Jesus have. I wonder if we need to repent for wanting all the benefits from living in Jesus' kingdom, but not really wanting him to be king. Advent is a good time to evaluate. We need to evaluate where we live more under our own rule than under the rule of Jesus. At Advent, we wait for life under Jesus' rule. We wait for our relationships and creation to perfectly reflect God's character. We wait for a day when we know Jesus so completely, so personally, that we automatically respond to everything just like him. And all of that world transformation kicked into high gear that night that Jesus was born. And that's what this passage is all about. That first Christmas began the transformation of a broken world in a way that no one could imagine. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey goes back to the same broken world that he left at the beginning of the movie. The things that happened to him that made him despair were still there. But his perspective has been changed by the reality that things could be worse. And they certainly would be worse if he had never been born. The prophets don't change our perspective by telling us that things could be worse. The prophets tell us that things will be better. Not because we were born, but because Jesus was born. He does rule. One day his rule will be felt by all of creation. And Isaiah would tell us to start today to live like that is true. So how do we do that? There are four suggestions on your note sheet. also want to point out to you or remind you that on the bulletin that you have, there's a place that you can indicate how you want to respond, whether it's one of those four or something else. And would encourage you, to drop that off, that part of the bulletin in one of the boxes in the foyer so we can pray for you. We as a staff take those and we really do pray for you as you try to seek and apply God's word. But here are four suggestions. I always start with prayer. Ask God to give you a bigger picture of salvation 
ask him to help you really internalize that salvation is not something that you have to wait for until you die. Your salvation is a part of your life today. And it is something that God is also bringing to all of creation. Discuss the questions again. Involve other believers in your life as you seek to know the Lord better and to grow into his likeness. Study Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. And my encouragement to you is to go through this passage again and just make notes of everything that you see about who God is. And I've been encouraging you each week to identify someone who is not a Christian. And this week, what I would ask you to do is to ask the question, how can you give this person or this family a picture of God's transforming work? And how can you do it this Christmas season? Whether it's inviting them to your home, whether it's inviting them to something with the group from FBC, whether it's going out with them or just spending time with them, how can you give them a picture, a glimpse of what this passage talks about? I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. As the prayer team comes forward, one of the questions you have to ask is, have you met this king? Do you know him? Have you met under his rule? If you want to meet him and know him, we would love to introduce him to you. Please let us do that. But that's not the only reason these folks are up here. We are here to pray for you no matter what you need. If you're struggling with finances, Christmas is a really, really hard season for a lot of people. If you're dealing with emotions of loss or pain, whatever you are struggling with, just decisions in life, we are here to pray for you. Please come forward and let us pray with you, whatever the concern. Would you stand and pray with me as we close? Jesus, just before you ascended, you said these words to your apostles. You said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. We are reminded this morning that you are king that you are ruler, that you possess all authority. And you possess all authority to do in our lives what you would do. And Lord, as we've seen in this passage, what you want to do is not to hurt us. What you want to do to us is not cruel. What you want to do is to give us an extraordinary world that is beyond our imagination. And you even invite us to begin participating in that today. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to live as citizens under your rule today, every day, but especially this Christmas when people are looking around and already attuned to the fact that you came and something is different because of it. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is the promised king. He is the king who brings peace and great joy. So our challenge is to leave here and live under his rule this week. You are dismissed.